I am Dr. D. Silver. I am head of the section of neurology at Scripps Memorial Hospital, La Jolla, California. I'm also medical director of the Parkinson's Disease Association of San Diego. Now tonight's program is on restless leg syndrome, or what we call RLS. As a movement disorder specialist, I see many patients with restless leg syndrome since it occurs in 15% of patients with Parkinson's disease. And 10% of the population actually has restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome, however, does not anticipate nor does it predict Parkinson's disease or probably any other neurodegenerative disease. Restless leg syndrome is a neurological movement disorder characterized by an irresistible urge to move the legs accompanied by an uncomfortable sensation that oftentimes occurs in the evening or when at rest. It affects 10% of the population. Sleep disturbance is oftentimes the main reason patients seek medical attention. They're not aware of their restless leg. It's oftentimes now believed to be associated with a dopaminergic dysfunction, dopamine metabolism abnormal, much like that of Parkinson's disease. Oftentimes we may limit the ability of a patient with restless leg and they have difficulty extending periods of time when they have to sit or where they have to sit on planes or be in chairs or when they're going to sleep at night. Now the overview of tonight's discussion on RLS will contain some important features. We're going to talk about the four key features of RLS. We're going to talk about the one drug that the FDA has approved, ropinirol, and we'll give you four clinical trial studies, how it's been shown to be efficacious. And we're going to talk about side effects of drugs, and we always want to mention the concept of the triangle for evaluating any drug when we use it on a patient. And that triangle is efficacy, tolerability, and safety. These drugs are safe, so we're going to talk about efficacy and we're going to talk about tolerability. And we always have to remember that we need to tailor the use of any drug to each individual patient. We call it that tailoring and individualizing the treatment. And there are other drugs that can be used for the treatment of RLS, but they are off-label, but we'll mention a few. The prevalence, we've talked about 10% of the population. It increases with age and it peaks in its incidence about at the age of 50. The onset varies widely, but it does occur in young children. And the onset can be in both men and women at any age, and it's oftentimes greater in women. Now this graph shows us on the left-hand side the percent of patients with RLS, and the bottom is the decades. And you can see from zero to 10, the first decade, about 20% of the patients will have onset of their RLS in the first decade, and then about 25 in the second decade, and so on. So it's a disease of all ages. Now, there are four key clinical criteria. One, urge to move the legs is noted. Number two, there's temporary relief with movement. And number three, there is onset or worsening of the symptoms at rest or inactivity. And number four, worsening or onset of symptoms in the evening or at night, what we call a circadian type of picture. So criteria one, let's look at that. Urge to move the legs accompanied or caused by an uncomfortable or unpleasant sensation. Irresistible or compelling urge to move the legs occurs in many people. An uncomfortable sensation that oftentimes is difficult to describe by the patient. It can be painful, it can be aching. Oftentimes, it involves any part of the leg. It's usually bilateral, but can be unilateral. And in severe cases, it can occur in the arms, or rarely, it can first occur in the arms. Criteria two, urge to move the legs sensations partially or wholly relieved by movement, but importantly, it's a temporary relief. The movements that relieve the sensations and give the patient relief is walking, stretching, getting up and about. Symptoms resume, however, 
when movement ends. Patients may use a counter stimulus instead of movement, such as rubbing, taking hot baths, cold baths, vibrators, other things that really will help and relieve the symptoms temporarily. Our third criteria, urge to move the legs, unpleasant sensations begin or worsen during inactivity or rest. Increasing duration of rest is oftentimes associated with greater probability of getting the symptoms and intensity of these symptoms. So increasing duration is important the longer the patient rests. Symptoms not associated with any particular body position during rest is also important. Criteria four, urge to move legs, sensations worsen or occur solely in the evening or at night. Key important criteria. Time of day may predict occurrence and the severity of the symptoms, independent sometimes of even rest. Symptoms may have a circadian aspect, meaning it has a normal circadian picture. And symptoms may occur at any time of day in patients when it's very severe. Now let's talk about primary versus secondary RLS. Primary RLS is when there's no other known cause. It accounts for most cases of RLS and we think it causes the a phenomenon to be a central nervous system dysfunction, mainly that of dopamine dysfunction. Now secondary RLS is some kind of symptom that occurs that fits RLS that is associated with another condition, such as diabetes, renal failure, other kinds of diseases. RLS may improve if the underlying condition is resolved or is treated. So secondary RLS is important to rule out because we want to think about treatment. So you have to rule out underlying conditions. And in these cases, it's important to get iron levels in the blood. So low serum ferritin levels or iron deficiency can be detected by blood studies, iron deficiency anemia. Consider other medications that may cause restless leg, such as the neuroleptics and renal failure, pregnancy and peripheral neuropathies that I will discuss a little bit later. Now, hereditary plays a primary role in many cases. And this slide shows on the left that the percent of restless leg syndrome patients with definite or possible hereditary RLS is significant. A definite family history that's positive occurs in about 42% and a possible in 12%. Now the age of onset is different for those who have a positive family history. It's lower if you have a positive family history, about 35 years of age. If it's negative, it's about 47 years of age. Now the pathophysiology of RLS is significantly interesting. The leading hypothesis is that there is a brain dopamine dysfunction. And that means that probably there is dopamine deficiency in parts of the brain. Dopamine receptors and their function is abnormal or the uptake of dopamine is abnormal. It may involve a circadian rhythm and that's important. And the deficiencies in these dopamine areas of the brain have to be better studied. But the PET scanner studies suggest that a mild striatal presynaptic dopaminergic dysfunction may be involved in the pathogenesis of RLS, much like it is in Parkinson's disease. Now the signs and symptoms of restless leg syndrome we've discussed. They're creepy, crawly, burning, painful, aching sensation that the patient perceives, not always able to describe it. It usually occurs in both legs, sometimes only one leg, and sometimes in alders. Sometimes, in rare cases, it involves the arms, and I've seen that as a very initial area involved in RLS. It can be daily, it can be weekly, or activity related, or it can even be monthly. So we have to tailor or individualize the treatment. Now there are definitely substances that worsen RLS, caffeine, alcohol, antihistamines like Benadryl, tricyclics like amitriptyline, and any of the SSRIs for treating depression, 
and dopamine antagonists such as Ragland or any of the neuroleptics. Some people will take alcohol before they go to sleep. It makes their restless leg syndrome worse. Now the consequences of RLS are significant. The patient perceives pain, they have discomfort, they have difficulty sleeping. If they get to sleep, they have difficulty getting back to sleep when they wake up. They have excessive daytime sleepiness, so they're sleeping during the day because they didn't get a good night's sleep. And this may cause job difficulty, and to many people, it gives anxiety, frustration, and depression. Now, a Entity associated with restless leg syndrome is called periodic leg movements, or PLMD. Periodic leg movements are leg jerks that occur at night while asleep. They must be asleep to have these leg movements, these jerks. They're periodic, they occur every 45 seconds, and it's a triple flexion of the leg, flexion at the hip, the knee, and the foot. This disrupts sleep or awakens the patient. 80% of patients that have restless leg syndrome will have PLMD. Now restless leg syndrome in children occurs, and as I showed you by the graph. Oftentimes the diagnosis is incorrect and is considered something else. But in attention deficit disorder patients, restless leg syndrome must be definitely considered. Patients with restless leg syndrome should have lab tests to measure iron and ferritin levels and ferritin levels are usually less than 50 micrograms per milliliter. 5% of RLS patients have iron deficiency anemia. 25 to 30% of iron deficiency anemia patients have restless leg syndrome. The MRI shows reduced iron in the substantia nigra and the putamen in RLS patients, and the PET scanner, as I mentioned, shows reduced dopamine in the putamen. The differential diagnosis of RLS is significant. Peripheral neuropathy, and that is caused by diabetes, alcohol, low B12, other diseases like rheumatoid, akathisia, this sudden kind of event that occurs in people who are on neuroleptics or have neuropsychiatric diseases where they're always restless. The difference there is patients with RLS have restlessness when they're at rest or in the evening. Muscle cramps are in the differential, but that can be differentiated because the muscle is hard. And of course, anxiety and depression have to be considered in the differential diagnosis. So RLS is a neurological movement disorder characterized by irresistible, compelling urge to move the leg, accompanied by an uncomfortable sensation that often occurs in the evening or at rest. Now let's talk now about the treatment of RLS with ropinerol, the only drug that has been approved by the FDA. It improves the signs and symptoms and it improves the quality of life of patients who do have RLS. Now there have been four clinical trials that have been carried out with ropinerol in RLS. Three of them have used the design that I'm going to show you. As you can see on the bottom left-hand side, that on day seven, all the patients are taken off all their medicines, and they're kept off their medicines till day zero. So none of them are being treated with any drug for RLS. Then from day zero to week 12, they are put in a double-blind, randomized pattern where the doctor doesn't know, the patient doesn't know, whether they're getting placebo or Requip. In the Requip group, they're titrated with the Requip until they have effective treatment, and then they're monitored. And at 12 weeks, the patients are then compared and analyzed in the Requip group and in the placebo group, without the doctor or the patient knowing which drug they're on. In this one clinical trial that was carried out in three different ways, there is an important endpoint called the primary endpoint. There's a mean change from baseline in week 12, and it is monitored, and they determine the IRLS score and total score. And that's a score that is done and determined to see how severe the symptoms are with RLS. 
Now a secondary key endpoint is when patients are asked whether they're much improved or very much improved, and we call that the clinical global impression scale. Now this next slide shows us on the left hand side the scoring and on the bottom is the weeks of the clinical trial and there were 12 weeks. On the left hand side you can see that most of the patients entered with a score of about 22 and the red line is the requip patients and the yellow line is the placebo group and they're monitored over 12 weeks. The score is reduced downward and so the lower the scale the better off the patient really is and the more improvement. And you can see Requip did a better job in these cases than did placebo and that was statistically significantly the case. Now in the next slide what we have here is the adjusted mean change from baseline in total rating scale score and 12 weeks. And what we noticed is when they compared the scales with Requip versus the placebo, that Requip always did better in these three clinical trials that used this 12-week program or design, and it showed that Requip always did better than placebo. Admittedly, placebo did have benefit, but statistically significant improvement was noted with Requip over placebo. Now, Requip increased the proportion of patients with a clinical global improvement when the patients were asked whether they were much improved or very much improved at 12 weeks. And you can see in this bar graph that on the left, in red, Requip had 73% improvement in the sense that 73% of those patients said they were much improved or very much improved, whereas in the yellow bar, only 57% of patients on placebo said they were better. They were very much improved or much improved. So that was a p-value that was statistically significant. Now, patients in another trial using the same design showed about the same thing. About 60% of requip patients said they were much improved or very much improved as compared to only about 40% of patients who use placebo. Again, statistically significant. Now another clinical design for one other clinical trial to determine the efficacy of Requip or Ropinirol in restless leg was used. And this study design was a little different. On the left hand side you can see patients were taken off all their medication and at day zero they were started on Requip and all the patients got Requip or Ropinirol and they were titrated to the best clinical effective dose. They were monitored for 24 weeks and the reason for this was to see if the patients did well over 24 weeks and would be stable. Then at 24 weeks they were randomized in a double blind and half were given Requip or maintained on that drug and the other group was giving placebo. And after 12 weeks, they were then monitored and were evaluated on how they did. Now this slide shows that when these patients were monitored after 36 weeks, Requip reduced the proportion of patients relapsing during the randomized treatment phase and it was significantly less patients that got worse. So in this case, the reduced proportion of patients relapsing was 32.6% for the Requip group and it was 57% for the placebo group, meaning Requip maintained the treatment better than, than did placebo and statistically significant. This next graph shows the time to relapse during the randomized treatment phase. And all it shows is on the bottom line this is the time to relapse and the chances here of relapsing are definitely in favor of placebo, meaning Requip did a better job of maintaining the patient's improvement clinically than did the placebo. So placebo didn't do as well in the treatment aspects as did Requip. 
Requip increased the proportion of patients with much improvement and very much improvement at 36 weeks. And this bar graph shows that. 69% of the patients said that they were much improved or very much improved at 36 weeks as compared to 47% of patients who were on placebo. And the proportion of patients that were responders who maintained the response was definitely in favor, again, of Requip. So summarizing our efficacy results in this very interesting design, it showed that following the initial 24-week single-blind phase, significantly fewer patients given Requip relapsed during the 12-week randomized treatment phase compared with patients given placebo. And there was significant difference in the favor of Requip for the secondary efficacy variables, meaning time to relapse, and the proportion of patients with improvement on the clinical global impression scale. Now let's talk a little bit about adverse side effects of dopamine agonists, and they do occur. And I'm comparing on this slide the placebo versus the Requip, with the Requip percentage being mentioned first. So nausea, somnolence, vomiting, dizziness, and fatigue can definitely occur when you use a dopamine agonist. But placebo patients get it also. But in nausea, for example, 40% of patients on agonists get nausea, 8% on placebo, somnolence 12% versus 6%, and so on. But these are side effects that do occur with dopamine agonists and ropinirol was noted in these clinical trials to have these side effects. Now, there are other medications for the treatment of restless leg syndrome, but what we always do with all medicines, including ropinirol, is we go low, we go slow, we individualize, and we tailor. Now, dopamine agonists are used, and of course, ropinirol is a dopamine agonist, and the FDA has allowed ropinirol to be released for the treatment of RLS. There are other dopamine agonists, such as pramipexol or mirapex. Levodopa or Cinemet is used. Gamapectin or Neurontin. Opioids can be used, but they're addicting. And benzodiazepines and, of course, iron replacement can be used. Now, there are some interesting treatment effects that are seen in all these drugs that we use. And there are three ones I want to definitely mention. First of all is augmentation. Augmentation occurs when it's an event of occurrence of signs and symptoms earlier in the day when the patient's being treated, or the patient gets greater severity of the symptoms, or other limbs are involved, and this occurs in 85% of the patients with levodopa. So if you take the drug at 6, and the patient does well for a while, but then they start to develop the symptoms at 3 or 4, that's augmentation. Now, rebound means that the reoccurrence of the signs and symptoms occur earlier in the morning when the patients wake up, or they occur later when they wake up and the improvements really aren't there, and that's called rebound. And then there is tolerance. Now, we've talked about the key factors and the diagnostic criteria here for RLS, and they are urge to move the legs, temporary relief with movement, onset or worsening of symptomatic symptoms at rest or inactivity, and worsening or bringing about of the symptoms in the evening or at night. We've really covered here four essential features of RLS. We've talked about the four key diagnostic criteria, the four symptoms patients will have. We've talked about the one approved drug by the FDA, which is Requip or Ropinirol, and we've talked about the four clinical studies for efficacy, three of one type and one of another. And we talked about the triangle for drug evaluation and tailoring and individualizing the treatment is very important. Now, I want to thank you very much for joining us tonight. Our topic was restless leg syndrome. I hope you have enjoyed it. This is a very, very common disease, 10% of the population, and I know that this 
will be important if you have the disease yourself. I am Dr. D. Silver. Good night and good health. This series of programs has been funded by the generosity of the Bell Foundation in honor of Glenn W. Bell, Jr., founder of Taco Bell, and by Elaine and David Darwin.